Hi, my name is Jennifer Kuykendall, and I am the Executive Director of the Wayne County Museum. Today we'd like to share with you the history of Wayne County Barbecue in our Whole Hog, the History of Wayne County Barbecue exhibit. So the idea of the exhibit um, actually came when Wilbur's Barbecue, a local legend, um, was going to close last year. Um, there were some issues and the place closed, and people on social media were so devastated. Um, there was such an outpouring and a very genuine sense of grief and loss um, that we thought, you know, something that impacts the community this deeply and people have memories, um, very fond memories of it, it means it's important to the community and it's something um, we wanted to explore. And barbecue in Wayne County, especially in Goldsboro, has a very diverse past. Um, it is white, it is black, it uh, is based on the origins of the Taino indigenous uh, natives of uh, the Caribbean. And so we thought at a time when the country is divided, uh, that it would be something to bring us together. Everybody loves barbecue. So we started by interviewing um, the gentlemen who were rehabbing and bringing Wilbur's back to life. When we heard that it would be restored and it would actually be coming back to Goldsboro, we were thrilled, as was everyone else. And so there was such an interest going on that we thought, it's an exhibit we should do. So we have a case full of memorabilia from Wilbur's restaurant. Um, Wilbur Shirley learned the art of barbecuing from Arnold Sasser. No one knows exactly where Mr. Sasser learned his barbecuing skills. Um, but he taught Wilbur, and Wilbur bought Hills Barbecue and opened his own place in 1962 and has been a legend ever since. Um, the interesting thing about Wilbur's is that it literally brings people together. It has been for generations kind of a place where deals are made, where politicians are vetted, um, and a lot of family traditions, people, birthdays, Father's Day, Mother's Day, um, they were always celebrated at Wilbur's. So the sauce, uh, the t-shirts, they've had two different presidents come and eat barbecue, one Democratic, one Republican. Mr. Shirley is a Democrat, but uh, he allowed George W. Bush to come and have barbecue with him. And Mr. Bush autographed uh, the baseball hat that we have here. And we have photos of that happening in, uh, in the exhibit. We also have very last knives um, that chopped barbecue at Wilbur's before it closed. Um, those are a gentleman, belonged to a gentleman, Mr. Radford who worked for Wilbur from the first day until the closing day. So these chopping cleavers, uh, it's a technique we've learned everyone uses. The whole hog is chopped with two cleavers. It's a very vigorous activity. Um, but we have those knives. And Mr. Radford, actually, now that the um, restaurant has reopened, is there working for them again. So it's 50 years at Wilbur's, and he's back again, which speaks to um, the kind of place it is to work. All the employees seem to be a real family there. So what is reputed to be the oldest barbecue restaurant in Goldsboro is not actually the oldest restaurant in Goldsboro. Um, the Lynches uh, were on the census in 1900 as being barbecue purveyors, um, but Scott's began in 1917 but it is the most remembered uh, of the earliest businesses. So Adam Scott, the Reverend Adam Scott, learned barbecuing, his barbecuing techniques from Arnold Sasser. And nobody is sure exactly where Arnold Sasser learned his barbecuing skills, but he taught um, Adam Scott, and Adam Scott got his start in 1917, as it says on all of their, uh, their promotional materials, he got his start barbecuing and his first um, yeah, big break. He was the caretaker at the Algonquin Club, which was the very top floor of um, the Borden Building. And it was sort of a, a Tony-exclusive social club. Um, 
and Mr. Sasser was scheduled uh, in 1916 um, to cater an event at the club. Uh, he fell ill. He asked Adam Scott, who he knew, you know, had learned a lot from him. He said, you're going to have to take over for me. And so Adam Scott actually went out behind the Borden building and dug a pit uh, and barbecued a whole hog uh, for the event. So they took the barbecue upstairs in the elevator, um, and it was a huge hit. So he became, you know, very um, famous for his barbecuing skills and um, very much in demand as a caterer. So he catered a lot of um, parties, made a lot of barbecue for other people. And then in 1930, he opened his own restaurant. He opened a restaurant actually in his, out of his home. He dug a pit in his backyard and he was so popular that people would buy the barbecue off his porch. Well, it became such a big deal that then he built a dining room off of the back of his house and that was on Brazil Street. We have a photo of it. Um, and so Brazil Street became known as Barbecue Alley for that reason. And I think he stopped a lot of traffic on Brazil Street. The restaurant behind his house, the dining room, grew bigger and bigger and bigger. They kept adding on to it um, because there was such a demand. And people came from everywhere. Um, some governors have eaten there. Ava Gardner, uh, the actress, um, ate there. Uh, in fact, she was so fond of his food that even when she was in Hollywood, if she knew anybody was coming anywhere near Goldsboro, she would have them get barbecue for her and put it on ice. So the restaurant became so huge, it seated 150 people. And so they knew that they were going to need a bigger restaurant. And they did open a bigger restaurant on William Street. That building is still standing. It's no longer Scott's Barbecue but the Scott sauce is still being sold. So the Scott's sauce has an interesting story because Reverend Adam Scott, who um, was a pastor for many different churches besides being uh, you know, a, a pit master, um, he said that the recipe for the sauce came to him in a dream and that he thought maybe God had sent it to him. Um, but he saw it in a dream and he created the sauce. Well, he tweaked it over a series of a few years until he got it the way he wanted it, and the sauce was served there uh, for many, many years uh, until his son, uh, Martel Scott, took over and spiced it up a bit. He tweaked the barbecue sauce recipe, made it a little spicier, and then he patented the sauce. Uh, and I think that happened in the 1940s. Um, but it's interesting, the sauce uh, is still available today in grocery stores and via mail order. We have two bottles of Scott sauce here. Uh, one is current, we just got it at the Piggly Wiggly, and then one is very, very old. Um, the bottle is so, so old it has no, um, no advertising marks on it of any kind, no barcodes, if you will. And so it still has its original 39 cent uh, price tag on it too. So the two labels, there is very little change. I mean, the yellow was a little brighter and that became their signature, the bright yellow and red. Um, but the label looks almost exactly alike. Um, the artwork is the same. So I think that's really interesting. Um, although the label now does say fat free on it which I guess was not important when the sauce was created, but now I think is a, uh, you know, a marketing tool. So the sauce, very popular. The restaurant, wildly popular. And so um, Adam Scott handed it down to Martell Sr. Uh, and then Martell Jr. became involved. And so Scott's was really um, one of the first famous barbecue restaurants. Uh, in Goldsboro, and it was certainly um, the first African American owned and run barbecue um, to be 
famous and, and actually have a patent as well. So it was a real family affair. Um, and we have some wonderful things, um, some great photographs, um, a great picture of Adam Scott in his backyard cooking his world famous Brunswick stew. And then we also have um, actually some receipts uh, from the old restaurant. They're very yellowed and kind of fragile, but you can see exactly um, how much the barbecue was. And they also delivered lo locally, like the Parkers. They started out as a catering business, um, but then when they actually went into a storefront, they still delivered barbecue. So um, they still, these t-shirts uh, are on loan to us. And the other part of, you know, the oldest uh, barbecue restaurant, their marketing is, it's the best you ever tasted. And that is still true and is still written on the sauce label. So Scott's Barbecue uh, and Doc, Reverend Adam Scott's Legacy. The earliest recorded purveyor of barbecue in Goldsboro was Mr. John Jackson Lynch. And he, a lot of people have claimed to be the first, but it's the very first census record that we can find on the government books here um, that says barbecue purveyor. And John Lynch listed in 1900 as barbecue purveyor. So we believe, as does his family, that he was the very first uh, barbecue restaurateur here in Goldsboro. He started out cooking kind of at a shack um, outside. Um, and then actually there's another interesting thing. There was a city ordinance that directed you can no longer cook barbecue outside. That you, to serve barbecue, it had to be indoors in a restaurant. And so he opened a restaurant and it was quite successful. It was downtown and then his son, also opened uh, a restaurant, and they each eventually had several restaurants. Um, and we actually have a bowl in the exhibit that was from the original restaurant. It's, uh, it's amazing that it's still intact. There's a little crack in the stoneware, but it's actually, some, it was used in the restaurant in 1900, which is amazing to us. Uh, we learned a lot about barbecue uh, from the Lynch family. Um, we learned that uh, this particular item here, which is on loan to us uh, from a collector, is called a gambrel. And a gambrel, you can see in this photo, in use, was used to hang hogs uh, for after they're slaughtered, to, op to spread them and hang them for processing. So I did not understand at all what this strange whittled wood object was until I saw it in the photo. Um, and so they would slip it behind the tendons of the pig's hindquarters. And they were very heavy. They were apparently much bigger uh, then than they are now. And so they had to be able to support a great deal of weight. Um, in another place in the exhibit, we have a more modern one. We have metal gambrel that actually will hang two hogs at one time, so modern technology. In doing research for the exhibit, we wanted to know the origins of barbecue, not just in North Carolina, um, but in the United States. And apparently, the tradition began with the Taino indigenous peoples of the Caribbean, what is now, I believe, the Dominican Republic. Um, they had a method for cooking whole animals. And they cooked pigs, but they also cooked alligators, lizards, all different kinds of wild game on um, a latticework that they carved from wood, which was called a barbaco or barbaco. And then the Spanish saw this te technique, became fascinated by it because it would render the weirdest, toughest game meats into delicious and tender um, foodstuffs. And so the, um, the Spanish turned that word into barbacoa, which then became barbecue. And so uh, Columbus was fascinated with barbecue. He came here and they brought pigs with them to the New World. Well, the pigs, especially in North Carolina, flourished as they still do today. Um, and so the barbecue here became huge. 
Uh, George Washington actually uh, had big celebrations and they were often barbecues. The, the colonists were fascinated with barbecues. And in 16, the 1600s, they say, is when the original vinegar sauce was developed. And so it remains the three, basically the same three ingredients, apple cider vinegar, uh, hot sauce, usually Texas peat, crushed red pepper, and spices. Um, and so it's just the same ingredients, but it's the proportions and um, I guess Ms. Grady says the love you put into it that makes it taste different. But really it's the technique of cooking the meat that gives the barbecue its flavor. The sauce is kind of a garnish. And the sauce is mopped on with kind of, looks like a little mop, uh, to keep the pork moist while it's grilling and gives it its flavor. One of the earlier barbecue restaurants uh, in Goldsboro was Holloway's Barbecue. And it began uh, on Pine Street near George Street. Uh, the building is still standing today and is now a church. But Holloway's Barbecue is one that everyone loved uh, and still talk about today, although it's not been in existence for quite some time. Parker's Barbecue is one of the legendary past barbecue restaurants in Goldsboro. Um, it was actually very near the Wayne County Museum on George Street, on Pine, George and Pine, um, across the street from the old Le Carousel, if you know that building. Um, and Guy and Yvonne Parker worked together. Uh, Mr. Parker developed the sauce and Yvonne uh, cooked and was kind of his helpmate and they partnered together to create some remarkable barbecue. Um, and it's interesting in that Parker's Barbecue, unlike some of the other barbecue places, um, Parker's Barbecue was the very first integrated dining room in Goldsboro uh, before desegregation was legal. Uh, Yvonne and Guy decided that they would serve to anybody who came in. And, you know, people asked Yvonne, well, aren't you a little concerned that you'll get in trouble or there might be, you know, some kind of commotion or you'll lose part of your clientele? And Yvonne said, you know what, if people eat together, then that's one thing they have in common and they will have a better understanding of each other and get along better. And so she was kind of um, a diplomat. It's, a, it's an instance of barbecue and everyone's collective love of it really, really bringing people together even before it was legal. Um, and so blacks and whites were welcome to come and sit in their dining room together and eat their food. And that was really instrumental in uh, early desegregation of Goldsboro. We have some wonderful hand-painted signs in the exhibit. We also have the sign that hung in front of the barbecue restaurant for decades and decades. Long after the place closed, the sign was still hanging out in front of the building. And the gentleman who purchased the building was kind enough uh, to donate the sign to the museum. And it's such an important piece of barbecue history, but local black history that we're thrilled to have it and to be able to preserve it here. Um, this sign that was hand painted, it's a great uh, example of kind of primitive hand painting. Um, this was in the, the dining room for years and years and years. And so a lot of people recognize it when they come in. And this case particularly and the signs, um, people express their love for the Parkers that still to this day, uh, they talk about what fine people you know, the Parkers were and how appreciative they were of their barbecue and how much they miss it. Uh, John Parker, Guy Parker's son, uh, took up the mantle after the restaurant closed and produced the barbecue sauce uh, for several years. He drove actually around the country with his trunk of his car filled with barbecue sauce, uh, selling it and now, um, it was quite popular, but now he's retired and the sauce is no longer available. So this bottle we have is a collector's item. So Parker's was very famous for their hush puppies. And we have learned uh, that John Parker was in charge of making hush puppies at Parker's restaurant. 
We have a very interesting wooden board that he, we couldn't figure out how he, it worked when they told us it was a hush puppy board. He said they made the batter and they let it sit overnight so that it got very thick and the board they would fill level with the dough and then push it off into hot oil one piece at a time and he said you could get a dozen hush puppies off of the, bar the hush puppy board. Um, they were famous for their coleslaw and they were also uh, well famous for the sauce. We do actually have this of which looks like not much, but this is the actual fire extinguisher that was used in Parker's restaurant for a, a long time. It was right in the dining room, and so this is one of the more interesting and strange uh, loans that we have for this exhibit. So we were very excited to get on loan Guy Parker's actual personal chopping cleavers that he chopped barbecue with every day at the restaurant. They are clearly well used and well loved, and they are real treasures, family heirlooms of the Parker family, and we're thrilled that they loaned them to us, that they entrusted us with them. So one of the current, we've talked about some of the older places that no longer exist, barbecue of the past, but this display case represents one of the favorite barbecue um, places outside Goldsboro. Uh, Grady's Restaurant is located in Dudley. Some people say Grady's, some people say Grady's. I asked uh, Ms. Grady, the first lady of barbecue, uh, how, how it is pronounced. How, I, I want to get it right. Is it Grady's or Grady's? And she said, well, both. I said, how is that? And she said, well, if you're from the north, you say Grady's. And if you're from the south, you say Grady's. And I said, well, what do you say? And she said, well, I say Grady's, but it doesn't matter. So it, pretty amiable. Um, but still, it's interesting. It's a restaurant that has basically two names because nobody um, here can decide exactly how it's pronounced. And it's a topic of, of some debate. Um, but in 1986, um, Mrs. Grady uh, went to work with Mr. Grady. She wanted to spend more time with him, and so they started the restaurant together, and they continue to work together, um, and we, they have won almost every award you can imagine um, in the barbecue game. And so we have a lot of their awards on display. Uh, we even have the actual hush puppy, it's a metal hush puppy pot that she boiled hush puppies in, in oil, in 1986, and it's tiny. And she said that they became so popular that she was just constantly, constantly, constantly frying hush puppies. And so having that original um, metal pot, it's hard to believe such a small metal pot actually turned out that many hush puppies, but now they have a much bigger uh, capacity, I understand, but we do have the original pot, which is neat. Um, we also have, she actually brought us a jar of their secret sauce. We don't know what's in it. Nobody wants to tell us their secret, but it's actually a jar of their sauce that she scooped up for us. Um, we do also have uh, Steve Grady's chopping knives that he used in the restaurant. Um, he's still chopping barbecue, just not with these knives right now. So we've learned from speaking with all the pit masters all over town that they say the barbecue can only be as good as the hog that it is cooked from. And the finest hogs we have learned come from Nahanta Pork Center. Nahanta Pork Center was founded in the 50s by Mr. Mac Pierce. Uh, and then in 1975, it expanded into a huge pork center. I guess it's gotten bigger and bigger, and now it is a wonderland of pork. So Larry took over from his father and is now actually our sheriff, uh, which is interesting. And then his son, Brandon Pierce, has taken over um, management and the daily operations of Nahanta. They have everything there um, that you can imagine made from pork. They have very famous country ham, they have sausages, they have pork rinds, uh, they have what they call, and it's acres of hams. And it's really, you can go and see 
a lot more hams than you expect to see in one place. Um, but they offer really everything from you know the the snoot to the tail of the hog, and they have supplied all of the best um, pitmasters in town. Everyone from um, Wilbur's uh, to Parker's, um, etc. And so Nahunta are really um, one of the foundations of the barbecue um, industry here in Goldsboro and Wayne County. So we've learned that part of the flavor of barbecue, which is chopped in a chopping block or a chopping box with two cleavers traditionally, um, that the meat seasons, the board seasons the meat as it's chopped. And so this is a very, very old um, chopping block that was on loan to us um, from Wayne Acock and his father, Wayne Acock Sr., used this chopping block for many, many years um, to provide barbecue for the Nahanta Fire Department. Um, they did fundraisers. And actually this case, as well as this, we have some photos of them in action, which is interesting. And you can see how much the wood has been chopped up and the board as it's chopped is what helps flavor the meat and makes every uh, barbecue a little different. Um, barbecue has done good in the community to raise funds for everything from the fire department to um, Q for Kids, uh, which is created um, by the Salvation Army. Um, an annual event, which is always really, really fun here, that's barbecue based, is Pig in the Park. And that is the big annual fundraiser for the Boys and Girls Club of Goldsboro. Um, it's really fun because teams of pit masters who take it very, very seriously come and compete uh, in a huge barbecue cook off and for bragging rights, for trophies, and also. Um, to have their picture taken with Barbie. This is the official, she looks a little, a little strange. She was made from apparently a water cooler bottle and she is the mascot that all of the sponsors have their photo taken with and often the winners of the barbecue contest. Um, another aspect of Pig in the Park besides the barbecue cooking is the Kiss the Pig competition. And local celebrities uh, about town raise money um, by getting votes for them to be boss hog and kiss the pig. Um, and we have uh, a picture, several pictures in the case of a very beloved local um, gentleman, uh, Bob Bass, who was boss hog last year and just recently passed away. And so you can see him kissing a pig and he said it was a, a great honor. Um, we also have information on some of the other uh, community fundraisers. Uh, schools have used barbecue for fundraisers. Churches have used barbecues for fundraisers, um, as well as volunteer fire departments. So it's barbecue is really a way of life in Eastern North Carolina. Um, and really, you can't separate it from the community. It plays so many different roles here. So when we told people we would be doing a barbecue exhibit um, and it would be focused on primarily Goldsboro and Wayne County, we were told on a couple of different occasions, well, you need to stretch the limits a little bit of your geographical focus. And so we did because there is a very beloved restaurant called the Skylight Inn. Um, that has such a huge cult following and a really interesting building. Their building uh, is kind of one of those roadside attractions. It looks like uh, the Capitol building. It has a, a dome uh, on top of it, um, so you can't miss it. Um, also, we have um, items from some of the other local places like Adam's Roadside Barbecue, which is interesting because it is a very popular um, barbecue restaurant, but it's not your standard Eastern North Carolina vinegar sauce. His sauce differs that it's more of a Lexington style sauce, which has some uh, tomato uh, flavoring in it. And so it's interesting that even a non-traditional uh, barbecue restaurant can be very popular here. Uh, it started out on um, Highway 70, and now there is another um, 
place downtown, just two blocks from the Wayne County Museum. And sometime, if the wind is blowing properly, we can smell the barbecue from our front porch, which is wonderful. Um, we also have some information from Rye, uh, a local family whose grandfather was a very um, renowned butcher for Piggly Wiggly. Piggly Wiggly are well known for their meat and their quality of their meat. But their grandfather was um, a butcher for Piggly Wiggly, and we actually posted his photo on social media, and people went crazy. Everyone remembered him. Everybody had um, a story about why they loved him. And so something we really were not aware of until um, we put it out there. Um, we often kind of put things out, um, ideas that we have for uh, exhibits, and the public kind of tells us uh, and kind of has an influence in steering us which way to go. And so including um, Mr. Rye in the exhibit we thought was very, very important. 